Who am I? Richard Casimer, media veteran. Why I got in radio is because I'm good with a knife. Contributor in Perth, Australia. Our friend Richard Casimer in the United States. Uh, how are you guys enjoying the 19th century? Is that working out for you? How can you say, I'm not making fun of you as a race, I'm making fun of you as black performers? I think as a country, Americans are as patriotic as the most rabid UK football hooligan. Who am I? Richard S. Casimer. Balls Radio with Phil Dobby. Why have journalists when the newsmakers are able to write their side of the story? I mean, soon, I reckon, news websites will just give politicians and whoever else is in the news, just give them the passwords to their content management system so they can go in and file the stories themselves, thus saving a fortune in those, you know, paying for those self-righteous, pesky journalists. Well, it's an idea that uh, seems to have gone down well with Indiana Governor Mike Pence, one of the Republicans in the U.S. who hopes to be president one day. He basically wanted to create his own media outlet so other media can pick up his stories and run with them. Uh, Following this is our U.S. reporter, Richard Kasmer. This whole thing seems to have backfired on the governor. Oh, yes, very quickly. As you say, Indiana Republican Governor Mike Pence, he broke the land speed record this week for derailing his own six degrees of uh, Joseph Goebbels plan to set up a, a taxpayer funded state run news agency that he was going to call just in that the agency was going to write distribute news stories and press releases via its own website and its own news outlet now Indiana's proposed version of TAS and Xinhua was going to be headed up by this former Indianapolis star reporter Bill McCleary McCleary this week informed the now media competition he told the editors that quoting now at times justin will break news mm. publishing information ahead of the other news outlets strategies for determining how and when to give priorities to such exclusive coverage will remain under discussion meaning that the state's new pro-governor propaganda machine would decide all of the content and which media outlet would receive it now suffice it to say Pence's plan to control the media went over like a fart in church with the Indiana state and the national media. Everybody just jumped on this thing and said, you know, we're not doing it. They were not going to take your feeds. We're not going to take your information. And uh, as you say, uh, Pence is a, uh, one of the many Republicans trying to pile into the GOP clown car. They, they weren't buying it. The agencies across the country have been cutting their staffs to the bare bone. And Pence would be paying this out of taxpayer dollars to fill this void of spin and misinformation didn't happen right well look i mean there's uh, i think there's another side to this story uh so let me give you my outside view on it in just a second but look you know when you're onto a bad idea when the local fox affiliate thinks it's a bad idea as well uh so you know when people on your side are, uh, are, are talking out against you just have a quick listen to this my understanding is that uh the website that has become a source uh, of controversy was uh, simply an effort to have a one-stop shopping website uh, for press releases and information coming from various state agencies it, it it's meant to be a resource not a news source but a news source is exactly what it will be according to pence's own press secretary In a release sent out this afternoon, Pence's press office admits that, quote, Justin will be a news resource website. So, um, so look, my take on this is actually if he's going to break news uh, on his own website, uh, that's actually probably a better thing than doing a deal uh, where he's uh, giving a promise that he's going to break news first to a particular journalist because that journalist always writes good things about him. If he's sort of like saying, well, no, we're going to put it out into the into the public space first, then, you know, there's none of these uh, sort of uh, backhanded deals that are going on with uh, with his favorite press. That might be a good thing, mightn't it? There is that. But the other thing is, this is nothing new. All the, most of the governors have their own PR person, their own press people, yeah, and they issue their own press releases and whatnot. But to actually build a state-run news agency is just out of the realm of uh, <laughs> nonsense. It just doesn't make any sense at all. And again, uh, he he felt the heat in less than uh, most most yeah. news uh, cycles uh, in. <laughs> so he came out this week and said, after careful review, we've decided not to do it. And again, as, as Joseph Goebbels said, think of the press as a great keyboard on which the government can play 
Only this time the press didn't like the music. <laughs> no, not this time anyway. Now, the uh, now this time last week, the uh, New York governor was warning people to stay home. He was uh, calling in the National Guard and uh, the media were predicting the, the end of the world. Have a listen to this. And help is coming from Albany. The state's National Guard will have more than six dozen personnel and 20 vehicles downstate beginning tomorrow morning. Also, the state police are ready to deploy 50 4x4 vehicles, eight all-terrain vehicles, and eight eight snowmobiles to try to help us out. But look, after even though all those resources were called in, Richard Kasmer, I mean, it didn't amount to much, did it, your snowstorm last week? Quite the contrary, Phil. Yes, it did. Oh, now, did it? Even, yes, it did. Even as we speak, New England is preparing for another major snowstorm due to arrive either tonight, tomorrow, the next day, or maybe not at all. Oh, well, and I, by I, May, thought what, I thought what had happened was that they were predicting all these things, and then they, that, that there was the, these question marks over whether there'd been a, an overreaction. And in fact, it wasn't as big as they were saying it was going to be. And again, Phil, quite the contrary. <laughs> yes, it was. Mm. By major storm, I'm also referring to the TV tabloid idiom of normal. That's what how we, we New Englanders call it. But uh, we did get a major snowstorm here in New England. And some of the areas are actually still digging out from two or more feet of snow. Par for the course in New England. This is just normal uh, weather patterns. But in this bad news is good news, uh, the, the media really hyped it up and said that every, this was going to be historical, Armageddon and colossal and, and all this stuff. To his credit, Mayor de Blasio in New York did call, as did the mayors of Boston, the governors of Massachusetts, citizens in the other New England states did do some precautionary measures by shutting down schools and government offices for the next day, uh, travel bans, parking bans and whatnot. Now, what happened with New York is there was only a 30 mile difference. The, the storm that was supposed to hit New York City actually tracked at the very last minute by about 30 miles in the opposite direction and then came up the East Coast and hit all the New England states extremely hard. Nobody knew this. So, so weather is not a, an exact science and what I found and we we accept that we understand that because it can change in a in a nanosecond mm. what I find what I thought was was ludicrous was that I'm sitting at my computer here on Tuesday and I'm perusing the online news sites in my punditry want and I, I came across this news article from an Australian news site that not only misrepresented what happened, but it also ignored the fact that it was still happening when they put this storm to bed. I'm reading in a report in PerthNow.com a story that they reposted from Sky News that called this last blizzard over and done with and that less amounts fell than actually happened. Right. And I'm looking out the window and the storm still had another 12 hours to go. Ah, and that'll yeah. be, you see, that'll be the time difference with Australia. Won't it? So, <laughs> so it's way, way ahead of you. So the storm's already over here as far as we're concerned. <laughs> Well, the other thing was that they called the headlines said that the uh, the weathermen were apologizing for the miscalculation. Now, weathermen is is not only sexist, but it's a very archaic term. All the meteorologists here, all the all the people who prognosticate the weather on television and radio, are degreed meteorologists and have been for about thirty years. These people have to go to school to get certified in meteorology, so they're not just the sports guy that happens to stand in front of the weather map. Because the weather guy is out shoveling his car out. So for, for Australian media to to poo-poo this before the storm had even ended ah, right. and, and not even know where New England is, for one thing. So that's why uh, I'm mis so, that's, so that's why I'm misinformed. So the, you had the Australian media saying, oh, it was a big overreaction. We can't trust the weather people, uh, weather men, uh, as far yeah. as uh, uh, the Australian press is concerned, uh, which is funny because I can't think of almost all are, uh, whether people are, are women, whether they're qualified or not in this country, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But um, so we so we're, we're there saying this is what's happening in america the weather people have got it wrong uh but that wasn't the story over there in fact you did have quite a big storm but it might not have been quite as big in new york because it narrowly missed it that's it narrowly missed it and again phil you when you look at how weather patterns work all the meteorologists can do is look at the satellite maps in motion mm. and then as the weather starts to track over various areas Everything is affected by topography, by heat rising from 
the, the cities and other wind directions coming from either Canada or off the ocean. So uh, you do the best you can. They're, they're, again, they, uh, meteorologists will admit that it's not an exact science, but reporting it is an exact science But when all you have to do is count the inches of snow after it stopped falling. Right. But apparently that's too too many moving parts for the Australian media. Yeah, well, they, they, I mean, they, they find it difficult to concentrate after two in the afternoon. Now, let's go to the movies, a new movie by Clint Eastwood. Hold on, I got a woman and a kid 200 yards out moving towards the convoy. Her arms aren't swinging, she's carrying something. Yeah, she's got a grenade, she's got an RKG Russian grenade, she's saying to the kid. You say a woman and a kid? You got eyes on this, can you confirm? Negative. Your call. They fry you if you're wrong. Yes, American Sniper is the movie. The most lethal sniper in the U.S. history. The trail says, uh, yes, new movie from Clint Eastwood about an American sniper, a Navy SEAL, uh, recounting his career, a career which saw him kill at least 150 people. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, this has caused some controversy in the United States. Richard Kasma. Well, the buzz on this Clint Eastwood directed biopic, American Sniper, it's based on the best-selling book by Navy SEAL Chris Kyle. It has less to do with the movie's six Oscar nominations than it does about the political divide that it's causing here in and out of Hollywood. Brief backstory, as as portrayed in the film, Kyle is uh, played by Bradley Cooper. He joins the Navy SEALs, I think, at the age of 30, much older than most recruits. And he joins up. He's pretty much a, a, a bronco buster, wandering aimlessly in his life. He joins the, the Navy SEALs after the 9-11 attacks. He pulls four tours of duty in Iraq. He excels as one of the military's top snipers, uh, 160 plus or even 200 plus, depending on who you talk to confirm kills story follows his personal life as a father a husband between the tours of duties and all the stresses that that go on b because of who he is and what he's what he has to do kyle in real life was shot and killed at a gun range in texas after he left the military shot and killed by a young marine corps veteran who was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder the circumstances are still vague but the controversy that's going on here is the movie itself and what it's portraying either Chris Kyle and or the military as being something noble and heroic and also skewing the reasons why he was there. Filmmakers from Michael Moore to comic actor Seth Rogen have slammed this movie, saying it glorifies killing, that it's a, a propaganda for the, for the military perpetuates the myth that Saddam Hussein had anything to do with 9-11. Kyle's own history of racist comments against Middle Easterns and African Americans has also been a bone of contention to people who are doing a lot of deeper research after this movie was released and Kyle being held up as a national hero. The right, as you can expect, they're wrapping this movie no, around themselves it. like the Confederate flag that they so worship. Media trollop Sarah Palin has accused the critics of being Hollywood leftists who are spitting on the graves of freedom fighters who allow you to do what you do. And here, yet there's another right wing myth that anybody who was ever fighting in Iraq had was doing it to protect our freedom of speech or our constitution. Such was not the case. Mm. Former pro wrestler, actor and former governor of Minnesota, Jesse Ventura himself. Uh, a former Navy SEAL. He's weighed in on the film saying that he will not even see it. Ventura won a $1.8 million defamation suit against the estate of Chris Kyle for a subchapter that was in Kyle's book that claims that Kyle punched out a man in a bar and that man was later identified as Jesse Ventura. Ventura says the incident never happened. He won that in court and bagged $1.8 million. So Ventura would have been upset by that because he was a yeah. right, for former wrestling or boxing champion, wouldn't he? The, the the he would be it would be a burn the idea was that someone would knock him out in a in a bar I guess so then well obviously he'd it, seek defamation Ventura you know for for all his theatrics he is the real deal and he is very much you know so he supports the troops and and he honors the uh, the uniform that he wore and also this country that he served as governor of Minnesota but mm. he's just no nobody no one that's going to take any bullshit and any any lies so uh, that's why he sued he had nothing against Chris Kyle's widow, but just the fact that that incident didn't happen and, and he 
it went to litigation and won. Right. Clint Eastwood is playing it close to the vest, and at his age, that's just pretty much par for the course for him. Mm. Uh, he's claiming that the the movie is not pro-war at all. It, it really focuses on the toll that uh, soldiers and their families have to endure. Personally, I saw it recently, and I found the movie as tedious as watching gunpowder dry. I, I didn't find it entertaining at all or enlightening. Right. Well, it's got to be better than the movie my wife took me to uh, the other day, which is all about a girl who went for a walk. Uh, end of story. Uh, now, <laughs> uh, Hillary Clinton uh, expecting to be the uh, Democratic nomination for the president, of course. In fact, she's expecting uh, there's going to be no one else. So she's delaying the start of her campaign. Have I got that right? Yeah. You know, one of the fundamental differences between our electoral process and that of pretty much every other country is not the fact that we have better candidates. It's just that we have so damn many of them. Yeah. A case in point, the uh, Democratic frontrunner and heiress apparent Hillary Clinton. Clinton has yet to officially announce that she's even a candidate, just the opposite. This past week, it was reported she might postpone launching her official campaign from the expected April until July. And the simple reason is that, at least to date, there's no real challenger for her in the Democratic primary. So why spend the money now? Which is not to say that there are not Democrats out there who won't challenge her. And in answer to your question last week, when we were talking about the clown car of the GOP contenders, is that the top contenders for for Democratic presidential nominees are Hillary Clinton, Vice President Joe Biden. He's another perpetual presidential candidate, but a bit of a loose cannon. He's a very affable guy, a very much the shoot from the lip reputation and a personality that's more akin to your favorite crazy uncle than a commander in chief. Hmm. Independent Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, he's always a possibility, especially among progressives. They just love this man. 73 years old, very outspoken advocate for the middle class. He's more likely to be a vice presidential choice if he even gets the nod. Former Senator Jim Webb of Virginia, he's being mentioned again as a Hillary challenger. He's more to the right of the party, which will attract some divided Republican voters to kind of swing their vote to the to the Democrats. He was a former Secretary of the Navy and assistant and Secretary of Defense under Ronald Reagan, even as a Democrat before becoming a senator. And he was also considered as President Obama's vice presidential pick, which uh, Webb refused. Another person that's out there is uh, former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley. He's being mentioned as a possibility, but he has no uh, national recognition. But then again, neither did Bill Clinton or Barack Obama. Right. On the other side this week, and as we had predicted here on Balls Radio, former GOP governor of Massachusetts Mitt Romney, two-time presidential loser, announced this week he is not running. <laughs> it was a decision that was made for him by the fact that the Republican Party threw him under the bus at the moment he announced he was considering a third run, which to date, unfortunately, now only leaves about 21 prospective losers in the GOP party to run for president. Yeah, well, maybe they were going, look, you can't run. You're a senile old man. Oh, oh, hang on. That's one of our uh, qualifiers. Yeah, you're still in. Oh, no, no. Uh, so Hillary Clinton's got all these people uh, standing against her, but but she's she's thinking that th- th- that doesn't matter. She's she's biding her time because she thinks she stands the strongest chance of anyone. She does. And, and she, in all likelihood, would run on President Obama's stellar record of turning this country around. Mm. She is not going to distance herself, having worked with him as Secretary of State. So I think that she has everything going for her. All the polls indicate that she would beat any likely Democratic challenger as well as any likely Republican challenger, including Jeb Bush, who has now been pushed to the front of the line because of Mitt Romney dropping out. Yeah. But it's still a horse race, Phil. You never know. Uh, and the rest of the world knows her, of course. That's got to count for count for something. It's uh, it's always useful when America puts someone forward who everyone knows and knows is not a nut job because uh, we've had a few of those uh, lately. <laughs> from the US not immediately lately but in the last uh, 10 years for sure alright well we'll talk to you again next week thanks for your time Richard Kasma alright brother